Pioneers in science have always found a home at Johns Hopkins. And nowhere was that more apparent than in the laboratories where Hopkins researchers were pursuing answers to curing blood cancers. But to do that, they first had to turn back the pages of history. Bone marrow transplant really got its start uh, after the atomic bombs were dropped in World War II. All the original transplant doctors um, started their training and studies in bone marrow transplant uh, as part of the armed forces. Many of these people went to work in laboratories that were studying uh, radiobiology, particularly looking for uh, cures of radiation sickness. George Santos, who started the transplant program here, worked in the Naval Laboratories in San Francisco on that project specifically. These pioneers uh, found that they could cure leukemia in mice by giving total body radiation, like you would get from an atomic blast, and then reconstituting the mice with bone marrow. Uh, this led to clinical trials in the 50s um, that didn't work because we didn't understand um, HLA typing, which is what controls your immune system uh, and leads to organ rejection uh, or organ acceptance. George did his first bone marrow transplant here at Hopkins uh, in 1968. Back then we called it bone marrow transplant. I still call it bone marrow transplant. I still think it's the most accurate term. Many people who aren't as old as me in the field will call it stem cell transplants. It sounds a little sexier, I guess. Uh, but I don't think it's as accurate because the stem cells really are not what cures uh, the diseases that we are treating with bone marrow transplant. It's other cells that get transplanted um, with, in, within the bone marrow. They all come from the bone marrow, so I still like the term bone marrow transplant or BMT. When I started, uh, the only bone marrow transplants that could be done were from somebody who had a perfect, or what was called a perfect match. And that's due to genes that you get from your parents. Our typing wasn't so good back then, so we could only do it within families. And it turns out you have a one in four chance of being a perfect match with any brother or sister. So the vast majority of people couldn't have a bone marrow transplant in the 80s. There was concern that if you use the patient's own bone marrow, you would be giving them back their cancer. Uh, as we had better treatments and we were treating people in remission, by remission I mean the disease was quiet, you often couldn't see it, but we knew it was still there. The analogy I like to use is dandelions are weeds in your yard. Complete remission could be thought of mowing the dandelions. Persistent disease could be the roots. Uh, we know that the roots are still present after you move mow dandelions, but the yard looks pretty good. And so bone marrow transplant was sort of going into the yard with a backhoe, taking everything out and resodding with new grass. Once we were able to get the yard under nice control, um, it became possible to do that resodding with the patient's own bone marrow. We've learned since then that the high doses of chemotherapy when you're using somebody else's bone marrow are actually not what cures the disease. It's actually the new immune system from the donor. Once we learned that the bone marrow graft itself, the transplant, was the therapeutic modality, it allowed us to start doing bone marrow transplants using lower doses of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Um, and in those cases, the chemo radiation therapy was basically just a way of treating the patient to prevent their immune system from rejecting the new transplant. When I started, the oldest patients we transplanted were 40 because older patients couldn't tolerate the high doses of therapy. When we can do lower doses of therapy, now patients in their 60s, 70s, and even occasionally 80s if they're in good shape, uh, can tolerate the therapy part of the transplant. In the mid to late 80s, we learned how to do very good typing of patients so we could check for the 12 markers that are on everybody's cells that control their immune system. Once that happened, we could look for people who matched patient just by chance. And it turns out that if you're 
of Northern European extraction, approximately one in every 50,000 people will just by chance be a perfect match. This is how the unrelated donor registries around the world were born. When we search for a donor, we go through all the international registries. They're all linked by computers. So lots of the donors for unrelated transplants that are done in the United States come from other countries, Germany being the uh, biggest supplier outside of the United States of unrelated donors. And even when we have enough patients for African Americans and Hispanics, it turns out that their genetic background is so diverse that it's hard to find a donor. So for African Americans and Hispanics, the chance of finding a donor are less than 10 to 20 percent. So we still had to find other ways of uh, doing finding donors for transplants. And the next thing that sort of came on the horizon were, was unrelated cord transplants. The cords are uh, immunologically naive. You could do mismatch transplants safely. And the major complication of the transplant that we're worried about is this disease called graft-versus-host disease, or GVHD. Graft meaning the transplant from the donor, host meaning the patient. That new immune system attack is what cures the cancer. The bad side of it is what is the major complication. That's where we've made huge progress. Uh, so we can now do bone marrow transplants from half-matched individuals and most first-degree relatives, and even half of second-degree relatives will be half-matched with a family member with exactly the same results and safety as a perfect match donor. Uh, so we're not perfect yet. graft versus host disease remains an issue because the major complication of a transplant now is not the transplant. The major problem remains the disease relapse. Unfortunately, the disease Cancer is still tough, and even when we use maybe the most aggressive form of treatment that we know of, sometimes the cancer is tougher than the transplant or any treatment that we have. For most cancers, if we wait five years and it doesn't grow back, we feel that we got all of it and there was nothing left. IPOP, which stands for Inpatient Outpatient Continuum, you can't protect the patient from themselves without prophylactic antibiotics, and we put everybody on those. So now we can do this without having the patient in, a, in isolation or a protected environment, so they can come back and forth to the hospital. We want our patients to stay active. So the vast majority of our transplants now we do in the outpatient setting because it's, you know, we think it's better for the patients, it's cheaper, uh, it allows much more flexibility in taking care of the patients. We've gotten so good at transplant that we now feel very comfortable with using it in sickle cell anemia and aplastic anemia. And the treatments that we've developed at Hopkins using lower doses of chemotherapy and radiation, having related donors for everybody or half match transplants allow us now to treat sickle cell anemia and aplastic anemia safely. And these trials uh, that we developed here are now being used actually internationally uh, to confirm our results. The other place we're going with this is severe autoimmune diseases. We have clinical trials now studying half-matched transplants in a variety of autoimmune diseases uh, that can't be cured with current um, therapies. The transplant has become kinder and gentler and still very successful. The next horizon in transplant is to help the new immune system hunt out the residual cancer. At Johns Hopkins and at many places, most of the novel trials, the new trials that are being used in bone marrow transplant are aimed at arming or helping the new immune, transplanted immune system attack the cancer. And take a nice deep breath. If you give somebody a new immune system that hasn't seen the cancer, it's gonna be more powerful with any therapy. So we're now looking at using allogeneic transplants for a variety of solid tumors. We don't think the transplant itself is going to cure the cancer. It's not enough. It's enough for many blood cancers. It's not enough for solid organ cancers for a variety of reasons. But 
If you combine that new immune system with therapies, that new immune system, where the cancer isn't invisible to it like it is with the patient's own, we think we have a shot at hopefully having a better chance of curing not only blood cancers, but solid organ cancers. This is no longer the last resort, but for many diseases that we treat, the first resort.